Welcome to another lecture on neural networks. And today I want to discuss convolutional neural networks, which are a type of network that is frequently used, especially in computer vision or photogrammetry tasks, where the input to our system is actually an image or 2D structure similar to an image. So this is the third part of um, a lecture on neural networks. So in the first part, we looked into the MLP or the multilayer perceptron as the basic neural network and <clears throat> we discussed things, what's a neuron, what's an activation function, what are weights, what are biases and things like this. And then we used the MLP for a simple image classification problem, turning this input into an output saying that the character we are seeing here is a five, for example. And we're actually coming back to this type of problem today again, but addressing it with a different type of neural network. In the second part on neural networks, we looked into how to train neural networks, so how to perform the learning tasks, and looked into training these MLPs, what is needed for training them. Training here means providing positive and negative training examples and adapting the parameters and weights and biases of a network in a way so that the network actually solves the tasks that we want to solve. So training neural network or learning basically means finding the weights and biases for our neural network based on um, training examples that we provide to the network. And it basically boils down to minimizing a loss function. I'm actually minimizing a loss function that computes discrepancy between what the system says and what it should say from the training data. And then we are trying to find the parameters which minimize this function using stochastic gradient descent. And within stochastic gradient descent, we needed to compute gradients, and this was done through backpropagation, a technique for computing gradients in neural networks. And this has led to an end-to-end -end approach. End-to-end -end means here we're putting in the raw input data, so our image uh, on the one side, and we output directly our output, saying this is a five, this is a zero, or an image shows a cat or a human or a person without <clears throat> adding manual features to the system, giving the system a hint how a digit or a person or a building or whatever it is that we are picturing actually looks like. This is referred to as end-to-end -end learning. And now we want to dive today into a convolutional neural network, which is a special type of network which plays an important role in computer vision or actually fields where 2D data is inputted and where the arrangement of this 2D data actually matters, right? kind of where are the pixels in the environment. And the network has a special structure, so we have our input layer over here, so these are somehow our image pixels, we have the output over here, for example, our classification, <clears throat> and then the network consists here of a special type of neurons, which in these examples are the uh, convolutional layers, so and as the name suggests, Convolutions will play again a role here and also some other tasks such as pooling layers. And then there's a second part over here which looks like an MLP which basically solved the classification problem. So we can see there's a part where we do a feature learning or feature computation in this part of the network. So once we learn it and then we can actually compute it using this kind of encoder structure. And then over here where we give the output of this to a classifier, fully connected network, MLP or whatever it is, this can be seen as kind of features or code that is then classified into our output. And that's how neural network actually works. So this part is a special part of the convolutional neural network that we are looking into here. And it's an end-to-end -end learning because the input is the raw image, the output is the raw label, so to say, and it does so by learning the features by hand. So we're not providing features explicitly to those systems. Okay, so let's start going back to an MLP and see how an MLP generates this input. And this will then lead us to CNNs and you may understand that why using CNNs is actually a good idea for image-related tasks. So let's go back to the kind of good old MLP input. We said we had an, an image, we were also using images as an example, and the image consists of individual pixels. So every pixel refers to an intensity measurement. So the amount of light that has reached the, um, the sensor chip of our camera at that location. And we are using those pixel intensities as input values. And so we tur we kind of can label them x0 to xn, that means we have n plus one different intensity values, and they serve as the input to our neural network. So they form the input layer of that network. 
So we arrange all of them in an n plus one dimensional vector, all the different intensity values. So these are basically white pixel, a gray pixel, a dark gray pixel, a black pixel, and so on and so forth. So those pixels that we have, we arrange in a vector. And this vector is then just a 1D structure with those intensity values. And these intensity values are actually put into the input layer of our neural network. And that's basically how the standard um, multilayer perceptron used the image data as an input for then performing, for example, a classification task. So the problem that we're having is we are here on this side having a 2D structure or a 2D image. And the pixel location kind of matters. It matters if two pixels are next to each other or are very far away in order to interpret what we actually see on that image. And the MLP actually breaks this spatial structure, breaks it up. By just arranging those intensity values is a 1D input vector. And that's a problem. So this approach basically destroys the spatial structure or spatial information that is stored in this image. And that means this information is not accessible to the network later on. And CNNs try to overcome this problem here by using the input data in a different way so we don't break up this neighborhood information, this spatial structure. So CNNs overcome this problem of breaking up the 2D image structure into a 1D vector by maintaining the 2D image structure. So kind of the neighborhood information is maintained and this allows the network to then learn features that can actually exploit this neighborhood information. So um, the, the features that we are learning or the different layers of our neural network have the possibility to encode this structure and we are learning those features through convolutions. So if we have seen even before for the MLP that the weight matrix that we are learning is actually very similar to a convolution or at least a, a weighted sum of elements. And we will actually see in a few minutes that the convolutions that we use now to define local operators play again an important role here because we can actually learn kernels. Of course, the kernels represent the weights that we are learning. So we are learning local patterns for which we are looking in the image and we don't treat this as kind of a global operator as for the MLP where we looked into one weight matrix as one single feature that we are generating. We are actually generating local kernels, local operators that we are actually sliding over the image as we will use it in the convolution in order to convolve an image and then use this information on where this pattern actually appears in an image. And CNNs basically have two special types of, um, of layers in the encoder block that they are using. And the first thing is our convolutions. So what I expressed in here, or very briefly described in here, they're using convolutions to define local patterns or look for local patterns. And then they are also using a subsampling technique to reduce the image size, something which is called pooling. So basically taking multiple pixels and reducing them to a single value. And that's kind of a pooling operation. And CNNs basically use convolutions and pooling as the two main operations that sets them apart from a standard MLP, for example. Later on, there came an additional technique, the technique of normalization in the game, which is not found in the first CNNs that are out there. But the normalization basically is only important because it allows us to um, easier train our neural networks. Well, we'll come to that very briefly later on. So let's start with convolutions, with the first key ingredient of the convolutional neural networks, which also is a keyword which enhance the neural networks towards convolutional neural networks. So it seems the convolutions here play a crucial role. Okay, so let's see what we have. Let's say we have an input image and it has a height and a width. So the standard image as you know it. If we have a grayscale image, that means we have a certain number um, of values in the x direction, in the y direction, and these are the number of pixels or intensity values that I have. So the width times the height gives me the number of intensity values that I have. If I, however, don't have a grayscale image where I have one intensity value per pixel, um, I may have a color image where I have more information per channel. And therefore, we can induce something which is called the channel or the depths, which is kind of and I've illustrated here by this cube, which stores the different channel information. So the color values, if you look to a color image. So if you think about an, a grayscale image, this can be of a depth of one, it's just the grayscale intensity value. 
And if you're looking to a color image, it can be an RGB value. So three values that combine give me that color information. And if I have an image with a depth of one, so this would be one times height times width. Or if I have a color depth of three, this would be three channels over here, height and width. So I have for every pixel location basically three values. And if I have multispectral images, for example, for example, images using NIR information as an additional fourth channel, then this would be four input channels over here. Okay, so just to have clarified what height, width and the depth or the channel information means over here. And what we are then doing, we are defining a kernel. And I'm illustrating here this kernel by a small image. So a small structure which looks like the image which is shown over here just has a smaller height and a smaller width. And typically it's a much smaller height and a much smaller width. And I can place this kernel here over the first position in the image. And the kernel consists of weights and the image consists of intensity values. So what I can then can say is from this combination of a kernel and an image, I can compute a single value at that position. So I can generate a single value for the combination of image and kernel at a certain position, which gives me one value, and this value is the sum of the weight at a position multiplied with the intensity information. And so I have my, the weights of my kernel and my pixel intensity values that are stored over here. So I can reduce this whole area, this combination of image and kernel here into a single value. So I have this single value, and then if you remember how convolutions worked, we are basically taking the kernel and sliding the kernel over our image, our 1D or 2D structure. And we're actually doing the same thing here. So we are sliding this kernel over the image, and at every position, we are computing this weighted sum of weights and intensity values. So that at all the positions, we are generating a single output value over here. And if we do this at every position, we are actually getting a second image, like an output image shown over here, which is basically generated for every of those kind of small box over here. So this box gives me one value here in, in, in this kind of image type of structure. And by moving the kernel around in this image, I'm actually generating this output image over here. So this is nothing else as kind of the output of a convolution. You can envision this as an output image. And depending on the kernel that you're using, it basically means this operation combines neighborhood information into a single value. And as we have seen in the context of convolutions, we can, for example, um, smooth an image with this, with a Gaussian kernel or binomial kernel. So if we take a, a smoothing kernel, then the output image may look like this. So this output could look like this as an example for a blurring operation. Okay, so let's, let's see what happens if we don't have a single image, um, a single uh, depth channel, but, uh, or grayscale image, but a color image. Then we don't have a single intensity value over here, but three intensity values stored over here for R, G, and B. But nevertheless, we are turning this whole operation into one value by saying, okay, also the kernel has three dimensions, and I'm taking the first value in the first channel of the kernel and combining it with the, or multiplying it with the first pixel in the image in the first channel with each other. And then doing this for every channel. So for example, I have a kernel of size five by five by three. So width and height are both five and the depth is three. Combine it with an image of depth three with the larger width and heights, obviously. Our image is typically larger than, um, than just uh, five pixels or five by five pixels. Let's say it's 256 or whatever, an arbitrary value, what we have. And then for all of those positions, we again get one single value out. So in this example, for this three by five by five kernel, we would have 75 weights. That means we can need to compute the, um, the sum over a product of 75, so 75 products consisting of each of a single value. So I can actually represent this operation that I'm doing here with a dot product of a 75 dimensional vector. I actually have two 75 dimensional vectors. One encoding the intensity values and the other one encoding the, uh, the kernel weights. Um, and so always a third 25 of them for the red channel, 25 for them for the green channel and 25 of them for the blue channel. So every of these operations for computing one single value over here, I have 
two 75 dimensional vectors that I need to compute the dot product for. And then I need to repeat this and slide this kernel over the whole image. So if I have an image of 256 by 256 pixels, for example, so shown here as the width and the height, then it will generate me an output image, which is slightly smaller. So here, 252 by 252 um, in height and width and uh, one in depth. Why is this the case? I used a kernel of size five by five in the width and height dimension. And so I have not 256 positions, only 252 positions where I can actually place that kernel. So the size of the, uh, of the output image, also called um, activation um, over here uh, is smaller. So it's only 252 times 252. So that means I have 63 thousand approximately uh, different dot products that I need to compute. And all the dot products consist of uh, 275 dimensional vectors. So it's a quite, fairly large number of operations that I need to do in order to perform this single convolutional output over this image. Okay, so that was one single kernel. So I took my input image and added one single kernel to it. And this is kind of one single local operator that I'm sliding over the image and generate these activations, also called activation maps over here. And of course, no one forces me to just use a single kernel. I can use multiple kernels, two, three, four, five, six, eight, 10, 20, 200, whatever it is, I can specify that I wanna have more than one single kernel. So what I can do is I can take my input image over here and then use multiple different kernels, illustrated here in this way. So in this example, I took four kernels of the size five by five with a depth of three. And these are then four different local operators that I'm actually sliding over my image in order to create my output. So if I have an image with a certain width and height, W and H, and uh, three, uh, um, a 3D input, then it's kind of one input image. I have four different kernels of the size as before, three in depth, five by five in the X and Y directions. So I'm taking all those kernels, sliding them individually over the image, at least so I can um, visualize this, which then gives me four different so-called output activation maps. So every kernel generates one output map. So if you have four kernels over here, it creates four output activation maps. So this is basically a three-dimensional structure. Three times is the depth, the width, and the height. So it's kind of not a 2D image anymore because we have the, the channel information in there, so it turns into a three-dimensional object. This thing here is kind of a four-dimensional object because we have basically three kernels, uh, four, sorry, four kernels, which um, are the three-dimensional objects. So I can see four three-dimensional objects together, which I can interpret as a four-dimensional object. And it outputs me here four activation maps, which are always slightly smaller in width and height depending on the kernel size. So what I'm subtracting here is basically the kernel size minus one. So five minus one is four, I need to subtract four over here um, because those activation maps are slightly smaller than the individual image that we have. And those, so the size of the output basically depends on the size of the input obviously and the kernel size k as we have seen. So the width times the height is the original width of the input image. So these are the inputs, these are the outputs of my, minus my kernel plus one um, in height and width, um, assuming I have a k by k kernel, and this generates me this output. So maybe that sounds a bit suboptimal that I'm always getting smaller and smaller and smaller in every image. If I wanna avoid that and have the same output size as my input size, I can do a simple trick which is called padding, something that we already have discussed in the uh, lecture on convolutions, where we basically expand our original input image and just make it slightly larger. So let's say if we have a kernel, which is a five by five kernel, basically for the center element, two to the left, two to the right, um, then we can simply increase the size of our original input image by two pixels at all the borders. So kind of two pixels around the borders over here and just extending it with zeros, for example, it's called zero padding. And then I basically artificially increase my input image so that the output image will have the same size than my original input image had. And there are different techniques how I can do this, padding with zeros, wrapping, clamping, mirroring, different techniques to do it. In the CNN world, we typically, at least if we work with images, typically use 
these, um, these, the zero padding over here. If I have some special structures like an, an omnidirectional sensor or a 3D LiDAR scanner, and I'm feeding this as an input information in here, then I may want to use a different padding like a, like a wrapping um, because of a 360 degree field of view. And this then um, is more accurate to what happens actually in the real world. But for image-based tasks, we typically use this zero padding over here. It's at least a standard choice unless it's differently specified. And if I do this, then the size of my output is the size of my input, at least if I set the padding correctly. So um, if I add the padding to this, I'm basically increasing this by the padding. And the trick is to set the padding as um, the size of the kernel minus one divided by two. This is the size of the, the padding that you want to do in order to have the same output uh, size as the input size because then in this setup if we do this this operation over here will turn into being W and H again uh, If I select the correct padding, but that's the way how you would compute the size of your output and typically you add the padding so that the uh, input and output are identical Okay, what I want to do now I want to go briefly back and talk a bit about this structure which I already be referred to as this kind of 3d structure or 4d structure and this is the notation of a tensor. So a tensor is something developed in physics and later on formalized in, in mathematics. Um, I want to keep it very simple, a very intuitive, and very imprecise uh, definition or description here. So you can see a vector as a one-dimensional array, right? So we were using vectors for stacking different values together. You can see this is a one-dimensional, let's call it array. And we can then take that a step further and say, okay, we can actually generate a matrix, which is kind of a two-dimensional array, right? We have rows and columns where we store our vectors in. And maybe if you have worked with 3D data, then the word voxel grid already came up, where we have volume elements typically used for representing the 3D space, um, which is basically a 3D structure, which you can see as you have a room and you're filling this room with small cubes representing that space where the, where the name comes from. And we can actually move that further and we can generalize this concept and the word or the term for this is tensor. So tensor is basically a generalization of the idea of an array or a matrix to higher dimensions <clears throat> with a flexible number of dimensions. So if you have a tensor or a 3D tensor, you can actually see this as having basically multiple matrices stacked um, behind each other. And here you can see that this is actually very similar to what we have in our convolutional layers. By just using multiple kernels, you can see this as multiple kernels over here, stacking them together, we can actually express this as a tensor. But you can just think about this as a higher dimensional array, so three dimensional or four dimensional array. So um, in this case, this is a 3D tensor, um, the depth, the width, and the height. Then we are using multiple kernels, each 3D, which leads to a 4D structure, so a 4D tensor. So if we have n, of those um, tensors. So in this case, this has been four elements over here. So this example, n would be four, but you can imagine stacking up 10, 20, or 30 of them. And this then generates me these output maps, which is again a tensor. And so kind of this n over here and this n over here is identical because for every um, kernel I have here, I'm actually generating one, um, one output map that I have. And that's basically what happens inside this convolutional layers. So starting with, with our input image, then we have this convolution layer which does all this operation and what belongs to the convolution layer are the kernel weights in form of a tensor and we also have a bias vector. So this is just a vector because for every uh, kernel over here I just need one single value which is the, the bias of the, of the neuron. So basically all those activations over here can be seen as individual neurons, as the activation of an individual neuron. Therefore, these guys here are also called activation maps because these are the activations of the individual neurons, but arranged in this kind of map structure because it contains, still maintains the um, spatial information that are already stored in my image. Okay, so I have my input image over here and it turns me in this kind of stack of activation maps that I have. What I then can do is I can actually repeat this information. I can take again kernels over here and take the activation maps as an input and basically run the same thing again. So the only thing which changes is that this depth dimension here or channel dimension, although now it's more precisely talking about the depth rather than original channel because it doesn't necessarily refer to the RGB values 
anymore in our input image. So this is kind of have a larger dimensions, but I can still do the same operation over here with a kernel convolving different uh, the dimensions in here and picking maybe different elements of my um, of my input um, activation map stack, so to say, and turning that into new activation stack. So what I can do is I can actually stack those convolutions or convolution layers with each other and combine one behind the next one. And if you remember the lecture on convolutions, there we actually said that um, we can actually combine multiple convolutions into a single convolution. So if we have our input image f and then a number of convolutions that we are actually executing, you call this g1 to gn, we can actually combine these g1 to gn by convolving them into a single convolution and then execute this convolution with our uh, input image. That means adding multiple of those convolutions basically can be turned into a single convolution again. And um, in order to break this property, um, we can add a nonlinearity into this process so that I cannot directly um, stack those convolutions and get a convolution out. And this is something which has happened through the nonlinear activation function that we have been talking about in the MLPs, kind of these activations that I have a nonlinear activation or potentially nonlinear activation of my neurons in here. So what we are doing then into in this convolutional neural network, convolutional networks, we have our um, input over here, then we have our convolutional layer, same as before, and then we basically pass it through the activation function, which basically treats um, all the individual elements independently and generates um, an activation, which gives you the uh, activation map that we have here in the middle, and then we can actually put that further, and then I can't put them into one single convolution anymore because I have this nonlinear activation function sitting in here. And that's basically what the convolutional layers are doing of your network. So they are basically performing convolutions, what the name says, and those convolutions can be used in order to learn patterns, um, local operators, in a very similar way how we used local operators before in executed as an individual operator on a certain image. And we can stack multiples of them so that I can use certain, generate here certain types of patterns and those patterns are then uh, combined in a different way and we have the individual convolutions and the nonlinear activations stored in here. And that's basically what the convolutional part is about. And then I come to the second part which um, are important in convolutional neural networks and this is the pooling operation. Pooling is actually a concept that is very simple. It basically just subsamples the original activation maps into smaller areas. So we are basically reducing the number of elements that we need to store. So besides convolutions, the uh, neural networks um, or the CNNs also use pooling layers. And what the pooling layers do, they basically combine multiple values into a single value. So it basically means we take neighboring pixels and combine those neighboring pixels into a single value. I can do this by computing the average, for example or I can use it by computing the maximum value or the minimum value or the median or whatever it is that I'm actually using. So if they have this example for max pooling, let's say I have four values over here and I'm computing here um, areas of two by two, I have the intensity values 10, uh, 23, eight and 35. If I do max pooling, I'm selecting the maximum of those four values and this maximum value is moved on. If I would use average pooling, then I would actually sum up all those intensity values, divide the result by four, and this would give me here the average value of 19. And that's simply what pooling is about. So with pooling, I can basically reduce the size of my image of my, or my activation map and um, combine information that was stored in individual elements of the original activation map into a single value. So I'm basically taking the activations from uh, multiple neurons and combining them into one new neuron, one new individual value. <clears throat> and here, kind of, if I have a larger image, not kind of a two by two image as in this small example, the stride plays an important role. So the stride basically says, uh, by how much do I move the, um, this local region or this filter forward over my image? It's just a stride of one, that means one pixel to the right, another pixel to the right, another pixel to the right, another pixel to the right, and always commu compute, for example, the maximum or the average. 
Um, so the, what, it, what it basically means is by how much do I shift my image into the X and later on in the Y direction um, in order to combine the pixel information that I stored in this image. And this here is a stride of one, so I'm always shifting this filter one step further. Um, if I take a stride of two, oh, this should be a two, sorry, not a one, this should be a two over here, then I have a stride of two, and then I'm actually computing the maximum always of kind of non-overlapping areas over here. So with this two by two uh, um, neighborhoods and the stride of two, there's basically no overlapping, so I compute the maximum of those four values and store it in here, the maximum of those four values stored in here, and the maximum of those values and store it in there. And this is kind of what I can do in order to reduce the size. So if I have here an input with, um, for example, as a, as a just simple image illustrated with W and H, and I do a max pooling um, with a filter size of two by two and a stride of two. So basically I have a two by two neighborhood here. This will um, halve the width and half the height. So a pixel or an image with just a fourth uh, number of pixels that I have in here, which would be the output of this pooling operation. So let's look into an example, see that it's actually a very simple concept. So let's say this is my input. Um, image in this example with intensity values and I'm performing a pooling operation. So I'm having here my two by two neighborhood and 35 is here the largest value which is stored in here. And then I have a stride of two, that means I'm shifting this two by two neighborhood here illustrated with this red box by two pixels to the right. And then I have 31, two, 44 and 33, maximum value is 44, so 44 is actually written in here. And again, stride of two moving forward, three, 35, one, 45. So 45 goes in here. And then I'm moving on and basically moving to the next row or next kind of row with stride two. And I have two, 13, 12, three. So 13 will be the maximum value. And then I proceed with it, moving through all the nine possible positions that I have here in my map. So I then obtain the output operation over here, which is always the Mac computing the maximum values out of these neighborhoods. So the stride and the size of the neighborhood that I'm um, selecting basically defines how large the output image is that I'm actually generating. What I can do with this, with multiple of those pooling operations, I can actually reduce the, the size that I have and can, for example, combine um, activations that I had for certain patterns giving a certain signal saying, okay, what was the strongest response in a certain area? By just picking the maximum value, I'm basically getting the maximum response that a certain kernel or convolution operator has actually been generated. So saying, I don't really care where I see a certain pattern in this local region or where exactly in this local region. It's enough for me to know where roughly in this region was setting. I'm only interested in the maximum response. And this is what we can do with this pooling operation. So I don't care how good, where exactly this filter was in this kind of small shift of two pixels to the right and to the left. I only know the maximum response I got here was 35. So I'm putting the 35 in here. I can continue this further on. So I know here in this area I had a very high response and this area had a fairly high response. And I can take this step further, doing further convolutions on this kind of reduced image and further pooling operations of layer through layer. And this means I will get values in kind of reduced images which say, okay, I found a certain pattern in this image or in the upper part of this image or the lower left part of this image, not caring exactly where it was, but the signal tells me I found something in this region of the image that give, gave a certain activation. And this leads to the term which is called a receptive field. So which activation at a certain position tells you about something that's happened in a certain region and not necessarily at a certain pixel location. So you can see this here, we have this green area and this red area here. And through the um, pooling operation, for example, what happens in here in this green area will be condensed into this green field over here. So if you get a response here in this green field, for example, from a um, max pooling operation, basically tells me I got a strong response from that certain green filter over here and it's somewhere in this area. I don't care where it is, I only know it is here in this green area, not somewhere down here. The information down here will be condensed in this information over here, so this red area corresponds to this red area over here. And if I take this further, doing further pooling operation, a response I get in here will tell me I don't care if it was in the upper left corner or the lower right corner, here I'm only caring was it in the whole area, then I get a response over here. And so 
This is what is called the receptive field of this activation over here that can say which area in my original input or a few layers before are actually able to influence this activation that I have down here. And this is what I call the receptive field. And by kind of combining this, con this convolutions and this pooling operations, I basically generate feature responses and can combine feature responses that are generated in a certain spatial region into a single value. And by combining this information, so repeating this information, convolutions and pooling, I can actually say, okay, which type of responses do I get in which areas of the image? And in the end, I'm only interested that certain combinations of pattern occur with a spatial neighborhood, but in the end, I don't really care where it happens anymore. And this is generated through these combinations of convolutions and pooling operations. So last but not least, I want to very briefly talk about normalization, which is kind of the third element that we find in CNNs. But it's something that was not there in the original or first CNNs which have been proposed. Normalization came up later, and it's... Um, somewhat more tricky to relate it to a certain pattern like the convolution that we used before. And it's actually something that I'm only doing in order to simplify the training of my convolutional neural networks. Um, so similar to MLPs that we just discussed in the last lecture, CNNs are trained with stochastic gradient descent and backpropagation. So backpropagation or to compute the gradient um, at a certain linearization point of my loss function and stochastic gradient descent stochastic gradient descent as the technique for, um, for changing the parameters towards minimizing my loss function. But there's a very large number of parameters that need to be um, determined through this process and it can be actually quite tricky to train those neural networks. Um, and we especially need rather large training sets um, in order to train those neural networks. One of the reasons is that we need to basically also learn the features which in the traditional machine learning methods have been provided by hand or were user given and I only need to basically combine existing features. Here we are learning the features together in an end-to-end -end fashion. And this stochastic gradient descent process, uh, process can actually take very long and as we have seen last time um, is prone to local minima as well. So if you want to have a brief repetition of what stochastic gradient descent and backpropagation did, you may want to go back to those two five-minute videos explaining um, stochastic gradient descent um, and backpropagation. And um, the normalization is simply a normalization that I do of my activation maps that help the optimization process. It's not entirely clear or fully understood why this normalization helps, um, but what, it, what we are actually doing, we're actually performing a normalization on the activations with respect to the mean and the, the variance information that we have in there. And then uh, stochastic gradient descent allows me um, to optimize. If I normalize them, I typically get a better performance. There are different ways how I can normalize it. So over the mini batches that I'm creating, it has certain disadvantages as well. We can do it by layers or over instances. Um, so there are different ways how can I can actually perform this normalization. I don't want to dive here into the details, although normalization is important in practical applications, but I'm not sure it brings a lot of understanding in, um, in kind of what the idea behind those networks are in this lecture here. So if you want to implement this, normalization is important for your training, but something that I won't cover deeply in here today. Okay, so let's look to an example. Let's look to the example of the kind of first CNN, which was proposed by Jan LeCun in um, 1989 and um, this is the uh, Linet 5 has called it was kind of the first convolutional uh, neural network that was actually used and it was used for recognizing handwritten digits so something an example that we have seen and exploited in the MLP context as well um, uh, and what we are used what we're doing here we're using the framework of these convolutional layers in order to perform this task. And the basic network had five layers, so two convolutional layers and three fully connected ones, so it was a fairly small network, at least for, um, for today's standards. <clears throat> so five layers, two convolutional and three fully connected ones, so the convolutional layers used different kernels to generate these um, 
um, to, to generate features that are then used by the fully connected layers in order to make the classification decision. And um, it used different operations, so convolutions and pooling at that time, average pooling, not max pooling, and activation functions in order to combine that here. So we started with our input image here, 32 by 32 pixel, and then performed convolutions here using six different um, kernels, which generated these feature maps over here, then a pooling operation where all the, what happens in this area is actually combined here into a single value. Then again, convolutions which are executed here now turning into 16 different feature maps that we have over here now by size 10 by 10. And then I have uh, another uh, subset over here, then the fully connected layers over here, which then perform the classification based on the feature maps that I have here in this, uh, in this output layer over here. <clears throat> oh, sorry. From here to here is a subsampling, so a pooling operation, reducing the image size um, again by with a two by two neighborhood, and then these are the final feature maps, which then are classified using this uh, full output layer. We can also um, specify it a bit further. So we start with 28 by 28 input image. So the 32 I said before is basically the um, the, the padding op operation, padding it to 32 by 32 pixels, and then um, so that the, the next layer is 28 by 28. Uh, so we have convolutions with a 5 by 5 kernel, a padding um, of 2 and generating six different, um, using six different kernels, then executing a sigmoid function as my uh, nonlinear activation function. Then we do a pooling of um, a 2 by 2 neighborhood. We compute the average, not a max pooling, which is more common today, a stride of two, so that I don't have any overlapping areas, which leads me here to a 14 by 14 information. And again, six different, um, six different kernels, because I'm doing this for every, or for every kernel output, I do this pooling separately. Then again, a convolution layer, again, five by five kernel, then no padding is done, um, reducing this to a 10 by 10 um, operation now having kind of 16 different kernels that were used over here, another sigmoid function, then another pooling, and then a fully connected, three fully connected layer, 120, 84, and 10 neurons, then leading to the output result of uh, telling it's a zero, one, two, three, until the digit nine. So this was kind of the first CNN that was out there. There's also a nice visualization that we can do, um, kind of illustrating um, what I explained before. So here are the different layers of this neural network and we, there's a nice visualization that you can do with tensor space showing how that works over here. So well, the first thing is kind of the input layer that you see over here. Then the first action which happens is here the padding. So padding it up um, from a 28 by 28 pixel to a 32 by 32 pixel. Then the convolution operation is happening. These were the first six kernels that were used for um, generating this activation map. Then comes a pooling operation by reducing the size in height and width um, by a factor of two each. Then we have again a convolutional operation now leading to these 16 different filters that have been used. Then again a pooling operation to reduce the size and then all the elements that I have in here are put into a fully connected layer, another fully connected layer, until I finally have my output layer over here. And this is kind of this visualization of this network in a 3D structure over here. So what I can now go in and can I kind of can go into this and actually zoom in. So I have my input layer over here, which is 28 by 28. Then the padding information, uh, which is just increasing the size to a 32 by 32 operation, basically adding two rings of zeros or borders of zeros around the whole image on every side. Okay, now I have six different kernels that I'm using. So I can expand this here into seeing the convolutions which lead to six different outputs of the convolution. So my activation maps, which are now from here, from this block are just kind of expanded so we can see the activations over here as six different elements over here. Then I have the pooling operation, which then takes those input activations and downsamples all of them to 
activation maps which are smaller in size. So this is a pooling operation that's happening. Then I'm taking those different six um, kind of activation, reduced activation maps and combine them with 16 different kernels taking different elements of these six input maps that I had and reducing them because I'm not doing any padding over here into 10 by 10 activations. Then again, perform a pooling operation which reduces the size even further and then having this output over here attaching that to um, the fully connected layer. So having the fully connected layer here where all the elements are form these 120 dimensional input of this fully connected layer and then having full connections between those um, and again a fully connected output so then I have then 10 values over here values from 0 representing the values from 0 to 9 and that's how that network actually looks like. If you have seen my initial example on how the network looked like you could actually see that this part over here is kind of the classification part which is basically an MLP which performs the, the classification over here with these fully connected layers and this block over here was basically the spatial feature learning part. So using these convolutions and pooling operations in order to obtain spatial features. And then what I can do is I can actually give an input to that network, writing down a handwritten digit and see how the different activations are actually generated. So if I write down a three, if this is my input, then I can see how the different activations, what they are actually generating over here, how this leads to certain activations in the image which are then combined into an output. So if I write down the three over here, it will tell me this is a result, this is a four. And you can play around with this. Now kind of network is flipped because then you can see the five better over here. So this is the five input, the padding, and then the, con the, the convolution operations, the downsampling, convolutions again, downsampling, then leading to the output. And again, the network will tell you that this is a five over here. I can put in a four over here, it will result correctly that it's a four, and then this way generate those activations. I can be mean and tease the network a little bit and put the X over here. And since the network has at the moment no way of saying, oh, this is neither a zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, it has to commit that this must be something. And here it says, okay, this is most likely a seven, which is maybe the case, maybe not. Clearly it's an X for us as a human and hard to match to any digit, but the network would do it. It would say, okay, here, this is the result that we here have this seven as our output. And again, we see the activations and the activations are combined in some way and the network performed the classification. And this is simply the value that you get out today. So um, that was an example of how a basic CNN works. And the goal of this lecture is, was to give you an idea how this CNN was actually generated. So CNNs are today the standard approach for image-based recognition tasks. And um, what I should note, I can also use this for other types of inputs. So I'm not constrained to images. If I have 2D structures, I can apply them directly as they are, but I can also use them for other inputs like point cloud data. Then I may need to rethink things a bit. Of course, I can just say my input is just a 3D voxel grid and input this is a 3D voxel grid. Um, but typically I have to downsample large point sets at least at that point in time because otherwise I cannot handle them size-wise or I need to define other input relations uh, or neighborhood relations in this image. And then you actually have to change the neural network structure quite a bit in order to go further. Um, but in some, a large number of different architectures have actually been proposed. So besides this uh, network that I just showed for um, for recognizing individual digits, there have been more complex uh, networks in order to solve more complex recognition tasks. I just want to now mention a very few popular networks out there. So one prominent example beside the first CNN was AlexNet proposed in 2012, so around nine years um, ago now. It was actually conceptually quite similar to the network that I've shown before. It just is kind of larger, has more convolutions, more kernels, and kind of a deeper architecture, but the end performs different types of, of pooling, so max pooling, not average pooling anymore. But overall, the ideas were not too different. And this was one of the networks which performed 
well, as the first network performed really well and made a huge step forward in um, the domain of, of image classification um, and won the benchmarks by a fairly large margin compared to whatever was out there um, at that point in time. Two years later, the um, VDG network um, in two variants with 16 layers or 19 layers um, have been used. And again, the, but basically takes the blocks of AlexNet and um, but using smaller filters, but basically stacks those elements together. And now I have um, 13 or 16 uh, convolutional layers and then three la additional layers in the end. And as you can see, the number of parameters that I need to take care of actually grows quite substantially. So we have uh, 100, nearly 140 million parameters for the 16 layer network that I need to take care of and then I need to um, learn those parameters through training examples in order to come up with those networks. And then there are further, have been further extensions such as ResNet, which is now a very deep network, it's even hard to visualize it, um, and consists of so-called residual blocks, which are kind of slightly different to what we have shown before. But so there also been an extension to the individual blocks that I'm putting in the CNNs. And this now has 152 different layers, is one of the really deep networks. There also have been variants of networks looking not necessarily to optimizing the performance, but actually optimizing speed because ResNet is something which is computationally more expensive due to the large number of layers. And mobile nets, for example, is a network a topology that can be used in order to, um, if you optimize for speed because you, for example, want to execute the classification task in an online fashion. If you are running this on your mobile phone, walking through the environment, you want to tell the user what it sees or using it on a mobile robot, for example. So these are just a few examples. So developments are ongoing, new networks are being proposed, but overall it boils down to having input layer over here where I put in my input. I have my convolutions and convolutions and poolings combined over here. And this is basically my feature learning part where I use convolutions and we have seen that convolutions are useful things for generating local operators and we are basically computing local operators on that image and we're actually learning those local operators because we are learning the weights of those kernels. And then combining them with pooling operations and normalization happens in here. And then there's a classification part sitting over here, taking basically the condensed information, so the kind of the features that we have learned in here and performing the classification and then provides us with an output. So this is basically the feature computation part. This is kind of the features that the system is finally generating on which a classifier makes its decision. The classifier sits over here um, and then this is able the system to learn the features and make the decision, sort of called end-to-end -end learning to map my inputs directly into my outputs and having this fully differentiable because I can run back propagation actually fully through this network. So this was a short introduction on our short summary on CNNs at this point. So the idea was to give you an idea to roughly understand how CNNs work. It probably was not enough information so you can sit down and implement it yourself, um, but at least should give you enough information that you can understand the concept of CNN and what actually sits behind it, namely using local operators and combining and learning local operators and then make a decision, a classification with a standard um, fully, con fully connected network or MLP in the last steps over here. And the CNNs are today a standard tool for image-based tasks and computer vision, photogrammetry, and other disciplines. And they are basically only consisting of these convolutional blocks, pooling operations, and some normalizations or simplified training. There's not that much more in there. Of course, you need to come up with a good architecture, and this is something we haven't talked at all about here, um, but most of the approaches that you actually implement out there will actually take an existing architecture and then just train it to your task, mainly doing small adaptations if your input data, for example, is somewhat different and you see obvious downsides, for example, from using a zero padding, you may want to replace this, but um, quite often you start with an existing architecture and then maybe go on modifying it. Um, in the end, it's a fully end-to-end -end approach which allows you to map your raw input data to the output data without requiring the definition of handmade features. This can be seen as an advantage or disadvantage. Um, disadvantage in the sense that we as humans sometimes have a good idea what good features are and we may want to give it to our classifier. Um, but um, on the downside, we first need to come up with good features and then maybe our features are just a good starting point and not the best thing we can do. And if we have a system that can learn the features on its own, this has 
given that we have enough training data under this assumption, the potential to actually outperform the manually provided or human provided features. And with this, I'm coming to the end. There's a whole bunch of good literature and examples online out there, also really good courses on neural networks, which go far beyond what I've presented here. Um, and they are a very good starting point for diving deeper, especially if you want to do research in uh, neural networks, convolutional neural networks, or even uh, more advanced networks. But I hope that was a starting point, giving you an idea what CNNs are and how they work, at least on a high level. So thank you very much for your attention.